Let's go to work. It is Tuesday, the 18th of February in the year 2020. Um, meeting of the State and City Council at 7 o'clock. Let's go to work. Would someone lead us in a flag salute, please? Uh, I pledge to the Thank you. Oh. Oh. I need to. Oh, I don't have to put on a show tonight. Ben, hello. We're missing one. Staff is mostly here. All that need to be. Good evening. Uh, was Councillor Ort going to come by? No, she's she's out. Okay, she's gone. All right. Okay. Let's see, are there any additions to the agenda this evening? Are there any declarations of ex-party contact or conflicts of interest or bias? Nothing? Okay. Uh, there are no appointments, but at this time I would like to introduce Mr. Kevin Mannix and he's here to make another presentation in the two or three that we've had already about the Willamette Valley Railroad. So, Mr. Mannix, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, friends and neighbors. I'm Kevin Mannix from Salem. I'm an attorney in Salem, and my usual practice is business law and some family law, uh, family wills and trusts and that sort of thing. But a few years ago, I became involved in transportation because uh, several farmers began talking to me about issues they were having with container shipping at the Port of Portland. So the last four years, one of the things I've been paying attention to is how do we help our farmers get their product to market efficiently and effectively, and especially cost effectively, but also what do we do with our transportation system to move freight generally. As part of that process, I became involved with a group, I led a group, which proposed that we establish an intermodal facility in the Brooks area. And intermodal means where you bring your containers by truck and you put them on rail so that you're reducing the amount of trucks on the highway, you're reducing fuel use, you're reducing carbon emissions. And, and take the product up to the ports of Seattle and Tacoma because there's a tremendous amount of exporting that occurs from this valley. So we've proceeded with that project and uh, that is a continuing project, but in the process we also took a look at other elements of rail in the Willamette Valley. And one of those elements was the Willamette Valley Railroad, which actually operates on what is known as the East Marion yeah. Rail Line. The East Marion Rail Line goes back about 100 years, and it runs 33 miles from Woodburn to Staten. It used to run across the North Saniam and c continue on to connect up to Lebanon. And that was in the days when logs and lumber moved largely by rail. But about 40 years ago, uh, that bridge was lost and that connection was lost, so we're really focusing on the Staten to Woodburn connection. The rail line is actually owned by the Union Pacific Railroad. They own the right-of-way, that is the ground underneath the rail. They own the rail itself and they lease it to the current operator, which is called the Willamette Valley Railroad. We became engaged in discussions about this because we were looking at what we can do in the Willamette Valley and in Western Oregon generally to resurrect and reestablish our short line railroad system. The short line railroad system is composed of 23 railroads in Oregon, most of them in the western part of the state, and historically they were developed before we had heavy highway transportation by truck. And so a lot of them were designed to serve the mills and logging interests and agriculture to move product by rail. This line, which runs from Staten to Woodburn, historically served businesses in the valley, and it also connects up in Woodburn with the Union Pacific Railroad line, which is a class one railroad, so you can import your products from anywhere in the U.S. by rail or export to anywhere in the U.S. As we looked at this railroad and started talking to Union Pacific about the line, 
Union Pacific, first of all, checked us out to make sure are these people legitimate, and they checked us out and decided we're worth talking to. They then advised us they've got four different departments that we're going to have to de deal with in this process, and it's going to be a time-consuming process. But then as we began more discussions with them, we found out that uh, they wanted to know what does local government think about this? What's the position of the uh, governing communities? So I began a process of reaching out, and uh, we do have letters of support and just supporting discussions. Not saying this is something that has to happen, these are the terms that has to happen, but yes, Union Pacific Railroad, would you please engage in negotiations? Because part of our project is not just acquiring this rail line, but restoring, restoring service that used to run on this rail line. The line, as most of you know, runs right up to the Norpac site in Staten. That is a, was a rail served facility, and then it runs all the way up through the valley and it runs particularly through Silverton, it runs through Allsville, it runs through Mount Angel and ends up in Woodburn. Right now rail service is only being provided from Woodburn to Mount Angel to Silverton. There were some washouts years ago south of Silverton that have not been repaired and those washouts meant that service was no longer provided. In this process I have contacted the mayor of Salem and we have a letter of support, the mayor of Kaiser. Now why those two? They're not right here, but they're nearby and they're big cities. I have a letter of support. Other letters of support are from the mayor of Woodburn, the mayor of Mount Angel, the mayor of Silverton, the city of Almsville through their administrator, three of our state representatives, and I'm still working with Senator Fred Gerard about getting a support letter from him. We most significantly have letters of support from three Marion County Commissioners saying this would be a good thing. And as you may know, in February 2018, Marion County spent $25,000 on a major study of this railroad, thinking this is an important asset to the county. What do we do to see about restoring service? And we've relied on that study for a lot of background information. So tonight, I can report to you that in looking at the restoration of service, there's some information I can share and there's some that, that I can't. I can share with you that we think it's going to cost about two million dollars to repair the line to restore service between Silverton and Staten. And that is private money. That's not meant to be city money. It's not meant to be county money. In fact, our entire plan of engagement here is that we are not asking the cities to provide any funds I've had good conversations with Allsville about three crossings there where there's some safety issues that need to be addressed so that Allsville can make use of 55 acres of land that could be developed within that community if they had proper safe crossings. And I've assured Allsville that our plan is it's our responsibility to come up with the financing of this, not the responsibility of the cities. I'm not saying I'm letting the state off the hook, you know. This is a, a line that serves state interests by connecting up with Union Pacific. And the state does have a program called Connect Oregon that does help with rail restoration and repair projects. So tonight I come before you to respectfully ask that you allow the mayor to send a letter that simply, to, to Union Pacific, that we would deliver to them with the other letters that simply says, please do engage in negotiations with this group to talk about their acquisition of the line. And then if we're successful, we'll, we'll be implementing a plan, which we'll be bringing back to the communities, about what we're doing to restore service. And uh, it's a privately owned line right now in terms of the Union Pacific owning it, but the last time I've checked, well, I know how to talk to Union Pacific now, but it took me six months to get through the door. Um, and people tell me that whenever they have to deal with Union Pacific about that line, it's very difficult to get through. We want some Oregonians to own that line and to be serving on that line, and that's what this plan is all about. So I would appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, get support from the state and city council through its mayor or the city council itself. I do have a few questions to answer. It asks, how does the rail line directly benefit state? Well, it's a restoration of rail service to a community that historically had that service. It means if it's being used properly, less trucks on the highway, a 75% reduction of carbon emissions for cargo. Moving by rail compared to truck reduces carbon emissions by a tremendous amount. 
The reduction of congestion and reduction of carbon emissions are two factors. But efficiency is another factor because if you're moving a lot of product, putting it on a rail car can, can work better if you have enough volume. I was asked uh, last two weeks ago, the question was, uh, what are the businesses that we've talked to? In a way, that's a trade secret because these are private negotiations about use of the rail service. But I can assure you that in our business plan, I talked to enough businesses south of Silverton that would want to use the restored service that I know we could run a profitable enterprise in running this rail service. That was an important part of the business plan. The Woodburn Intermodal Project, it's actually the Brooks Intermodal Project, we're being asked how does that affect this rail line? It doesn't really. Originally, we were looking for ownership of a railroad that we can also have a footprint somewhere else. And you can do that with railroads as common carriers. And we thought the Brooks facility would have a railroad for that yard. We still think it should, but we have another railroad that we're talking to that would probably be the footprint. And it's, so it's not necessarily connected with any other project. It's really a free-floating project of its own that's meant to benefit this part of the, uh, of the county and of the state. We were also asked about um, whether or not there would eventually be passenger rail and how we would handle that. The only way to afford this line is to run freight on it. In fact, the vast majority of rail projects where you have some passenger service have to start with freight. And if freight's running on the line and you're able to pay for the line, you may be able to add rail service, I think, for passengers. I think the best example is the Albany and Eastern Railroad, which is now a very successful freight rail line. But during the summer, they're running excursion trains on that line, which are good for tourism. They're a good opportunity for people to see the country. But you're not paying for the line with that. The only railroad in Oregon that really pays for itself with passenger traffic and not even Amtrak pays for itself, that's a subsidized service, is the Mount Hood Railroad. The Mount Hood Railroad, 95% of their income comes from those excursion trains that they run up that way, which is magnificent, but unusual. And uh, in, in this case, we're really talking about freight service. My dream would be that someday during Oktoberfest, we could have an excursion train running up to Mount Angel, up and down the line, onto Woodburn. Those are nice things, but those are sort of like the cherry on top of the ice cream sundae. First, we've got to deliver a freight system that works. I know I'm going on. I was trying to anticipate the questions that have been posed. And I really thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. And I am prepared to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Maddox. Questions? Counselor. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Jump in there. Thank you so much for coming out here. It's awesome to hear um, a really good explanation of, of how it benefits the community and our surrounding communities as well. Um, I guess one of my questions the last time was, do you guys have it, like, if, if it all gets approved, is, is there any guarantee that you guys are going to extend it out here by a certain date? Like, how many years down the line are we going to be seeing this partnership? That's a good question, uh, Councillor. The timeline that we're looking at is less than three years. Oh, great. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming, Mr. Maddox. Um, <clears throat> my only question, you answered everything I had so far other than um, the only question I have as far as would be pertaining to the road crossings in our community. Um, would your organization be responsible for the operation, maintenance, and repair of any traffic control devices uh, for the crossings? That's a very good question, and the answer is yes. Okay. In fact, we've been studying. There are some federal transportation safety projects that we can avail ourselves of to get assistance from the federal government, and, uh, and I'm encouraging the state to pay more attention to this also because I've noticed the state tends to tell the cities, you've got to do this, you've got to do that about rail crossings, and we're looking at the uh, federal grant and support programs and saying, no, the railroads ought to be taking care of this. It's part of the service of the line. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, for uh, My question is just about noise uh, that might be caused by them. Is it going to be like a, is there going to be like a no horn zone where they can't, like they have in Salem? That can be worked on. And uh, the Salem no horn zone uh, has had mixed results. 
True. They yeah. still have issues with deaths on that rail line in that part of Salem, although those appear to be two categories, to, to be blunt. One is those who choose to die by being run down by a train, and some of those who are incapacitated at the time they try to cross the tracks. And the no, the no horn zone hasn't done much to deter that. It has, though, there have been a couple of times when people have, um, have you, you can see the trains coming. And if you've got any capability to hear, you'll hear the train. In terms of the train noise, it's actually, uh, unless the horn is blowing, it's actually uh, no, no louder than a truck going by. Yeah. I just just curious about the horns, really, not the other part. But yeah, thank you for for that. Um, I think it's really awesome, like an awesome opportunity. And now that we have more information for people to watch at home and here in the audience, um, just understanding it more, what it can do for our community, especially with uh, the closing of Norpac, our farmers are going to need um, to to transport their crops somewhere else, I guess. That would provide a way. Yes. Yes. Any more? No. Thank you. So, what do you folks think? Is it time to? Yes. Public comments. Uh, I've got. Yeah, we can do public comments if someone. Russ, do you want to jump in on this right now? Thank you so much, Mr. Mannix. Quick question, I had two topics. Does that mean I can't come back for the other public comment? If I comment on the rail line now? Yeah. You can come back. Does it? Okay, then I'll wait. Yeah. Wait, when did we change wait, that? No, no, no. We didn't are change we, that. We didn't change that. Are we gonna comment on the rail thing now? That's what I... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so regarding the rail line, it was just, um, I support it wholly. I mean, you know, with NORPAC being closed, also, uh, it hasn't even been mentioned, but um, I'm sure you're aware that smoker craft boats will be closing within a few months and leaving. And so that's right on the rail line, too. So I really encourage you to sign that letter of support for the railway. Okay. Uh, I don't know why it's taken a month and a half to do so. It's uh, kind of a no-brainer that it's going to help state and, and they're not asking for any money and it's just a letter of support and if there are any concerns that that could have been taken care of at a later time. Thank you. Okay, thank you Russ. Okay, any others? Okay. Um, how about a straight up and down yes, no uh, letter of support? Yeah. Just sign it and send it in. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, same sign? No? I'll get it in the mail. May I have permission to go home? Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you for the thank information. You. Thank, thank you for coming listening. out here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and we'll do it on a city letterhead so it doesn't look like something I just copied and <laughs> sent back to him. Okay. Um, all right, no appointments, that was that. Under public comments, um, Aaron Frickel. That's what it says. I think his is for for facilities that need assessment. Oh, master plan presentation. Oh, I guess I'm supposed to read these first, aren't I? And Russ, you had something else to say under public comments. Yes. That's a whole different category. Go ahead. Just a, a couple thoughts on a chat I had after uh, the council meeting with our city manager, Keith, and we were talking about public comments in the meeting, and he told me that the public has no right to speak at council meetings. Well, you know how that can get me fired up. Uh, he said it's a privilege given to us by the council. So I just want to remind you that you're sitting up there as a privilege given to you by us, the voters. and. Uh, you're up there to make decisions based on what's best for the city and the citizens and not based on uh, personal agendas and I'm assuming that hasn't happened. So same goes for city staff. You have the privilege of working for us as we pay your wages through taxes and fees. So just please keep this in mind in the future interactions with the public and, and uh, I think that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Russ. Thank you, Russ. <coughs> 
And are there any other, anything else under public comments this evening? Okay, let's move along. Uh, consent agenda for February 3rd, City Council minutes is all. Did everyone had a chance to review those? Mr. Mayor, I'd move yes. that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Okay. I've got a motion. Is there a second? I second. To okay the the um, consent agenda as presented. Everyone's had a chance to look at that. Uh, let's go ahead and vote. Would all in favor of that motion please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Hearing none, we'll declare the motion passed and the consent agenda okayed. There's, let's see, public uh, general business. Facilities master plan presentation by the McKinsey Group design driven client focused, which is pretty neat. And I'll go ahead and introduce uh, these young folks that will make this presentation tonight. Uh, I'm going to start with Kathy Bowman, who kind of led the charge Wednesday night at the library. Uh, Jeff Humphreys and Cyrus Beatles. So, welcome, folks, and uh, just getting technically set up here. <laughs> I just turn on. I'll take a second more off. If we get that going, we might get. Get these lights turned off. Thank you. Oh, there we go. All right, okay. there we go. All right, uh, Mayor, Councilors, uh, staff, uh, thank you for having us uh, this evening. So my name is Jeff Humphreys. I'm a principal and an architect uh, with McKinsey. Uh, with me today uh, is, is Kathy Bowman, our project manager for the project. Jeff, is it? Is it on? Is that thing? Yeah, yeah I there think it's go. on. I yep. guess. I, I'll try to get a little closer, though. There we go. Um, and then also uh, project architect uh, Cyrus Beatles. Um, so as you may know, we were recently hired by the city to help define uh, your uh, uh, space needs for a number of different city uh, facilities. Um, and so if we advance to the next slide, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about McKinsey. So, um, so I lead our team of uh, architects and engineers that focus on public facilities. Um, these are a few that we've recently completed or have underway. Uh, so Kaiser City Hall close by, uh, Lebanon Fire, they just got their bond measure passed. Albany Police was completed here two years ago and right now under construction is Lake, uh, Lake Oswego City Hall and Police Project. There's just a number of them that we've actually done. I think we've completed more than 70 fire stations and 30 police facilities in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so we're really excited about working with your community uh, and working on your facility. Um, we were tasked with looking at your existing conditions, defining what the deficiencies were, defining what the space needs were, um, if that's uh, adding on to the existing facilities and refurbishing them or building a new facility and looking at the combination of uh, consolidating facilities. Um, and then tonight, Kathy and Cyrus are going to walk you through what our existing conditions findings were. So, okay, with that. So I'll get us a little bit started, a little bit, and uh, talk about the existing facilities that we were asked specifically to look at. Um, so we were originally asked to look at the police station, the city hall, um, the public works and planning um, lease current space, as well as the public library, the community center that we're currently in, as and the memorial pool. Um, so those were the uh, seven buildings that we actually took a look at. Um, and when we are looking at existing facilities, there are several criteria that we're looking for. We're looking at what's the space availability uh, for the future. Now, we're not looking just at 10 years or five years. We're looking at for 50 years or 30 years um, for a long span to so look at what's your population growth. Um, and we looked at PSU's population growth and Staten is projected to increase in population about 1% per year for the next 30 years. So that's a steady increase of people. And so how is the city gonna be able to maintain their current um, 
relationship with the community as well as our facilities, how is it going to be able to support the community? So those are one criteria that we looked at. The second one we look at is structure criteria um, so how well is the building standing in an event of an earthquake or a natural disaster what's going to happen to this building is it just going to collapse or is it going to allow the people to get out of the building um, and then the third criteria we look at is the building and life safety so code has changed over the years yeah, at the current state uh, what is the status of meeting code requirements um, and um, <coughs> as well as jurisdictional requirements such as handicap accessibility, uh, ramps, all of that. And then the last one we look at is your mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, operations and maintenance. Um, how long is your system going to last? They do have a lifespan, so we look at these life cycle costs. At what point are you going to just have to start fixing these items or actually just completely replacing them. So these are the four criteria that we are looking at big picture wise. And so we're going to dive in a little bit. We're going to start off with City Hall. Um, so as far as future growth, um, overall the space of the current City Hall is acceptable for your current needs. But when you look at your population growth and how your City Hall needs are going to grow, um, there is really no room for you guys to grow. Um, there's, you're kind of landlocked in that downtown core. Um, you can't move to the theater. Um, I don't think your community is going to be very happy if you took that away from them. Um, and uh, you're also um, bound by um, another property on the other side. So there's really no room for growth um, in that aspect. Building and life safety wise, there are some um, ADA compliant issues. Um, so while there are some, some measures already there in place, um, there are still things that are still lacking, um, such as approaches to sinks or counter heights or, um, or thresholds um, differences. There's also a level of lack of security for staff um, and um, amenities for community use. Um, it's unfortunate your city council chambers are not part of the city hall uh, where they're all combined, so that's uh, also another thought. Um, roof replacement will be required at some point. There are several issues with the roof itself, so those are things that we looked at. Um, the structure itself, while it's um, doing all right, it will require some seismic upgrade. Um, so in an event of an earthquake, we will want to upgrade that facility so that it can um, allow its um, inhabitants to uh, safely get out of the building. Um, its me mechanical and electrical and plumbing system does not meet the energy code requirements of this time. Um, it's losing efficiency, so um, it's almost at the end of its useful life. Um, generally, we see these equipments being uh, mechanical equipments be lasting about 15 years or so. We're getting right up to that point, and so you're going to have to start fixing all of these items or completely replacing these units. And so we've found most rooms are either hot or cold, um, so it requires space heaters, so you're now sucking in more power and different things. So most of the building systems, again, are really at the end of its useful life at the City Hall. Um, so uh, Cyrus and I are going to kind of trade off and um, uh, talk about each building, so I'll pass it on to Cyrus for the police station. So, so with the height differences, I'll, I'll I'll try to get down to the mic for, for everyone. Folks, would, would, when would you like to take questions on all this? Uh, at the end of each segment or at the end of the presentation? May, your, may, your call. Probably the end of the presentation. Fine. Go ahead, all right. Okay. Um, so the, the, the police station uh, on the same block as City Hall and, and the theater. So uh, police is an interesting program. Uh, their a new station is required to be an essential facility uh, in this day and age, which essentially means you're going to be able to be fully operational after an, any emergency event, uh, be that an earthquake, uh, wildfire, anything of those natures. Um, so right now in the existing building, uh, I'm skipping down a couple, but the structure of this current building does not meet the current requirements for an essential facility. Uh, so with that, um, there are options out there of seismically hardening this structure, uh, but those are intensive remodels. Um, then additionally, uh, future growth in the space, uh, really kind of we're at a maximum capacity if you've ever walked through the station itself uh, there's 
not quite enough room in the facility for things that the chief was mentioning earlier of uh, gender neutral or individually sexed uh, locker rooms, uh, th those sorts of facilities. Um, Building and life safety, again with an aging facility, uh, it's lacking in ADA compliance in some areas. Again, as Kathy mentioned, there have been upgrades and modifications made over time, but it's not fully ADA compliant. Um, lacks adequate egress in some locations, uh, as well as a big one that we uh, became aware of on site with an incident happening just days before. Uh, the security at the front vestibule, the, the main building lobby and uh, the reception uh, it doesn't meet current standards for uh, protections there. So uh, really just that transaction window, bulletproof, bullet resistant glazing on the street front is kind of what you would see in a modern facility. Um, and the, similar to the city hall, the MEP systems, they are aging, uh, going to need future replacement here in the coming decade at least likely. Um, and with that, they're not meeting current energy codes. So uh, you're not as efficient in your systems as you would be in a modern facility. Just to add a little bit to that, um, we also took into the site consideration needs as well. So um, typically for um, a lot of city facilities, you guys have city vehicles or patrol vehicles. Um, those are generally in a secure zone, whereas in both city hall and police, any city vehicle or any kind of, of those um, will not be secured and so can be a issue of safety for not only your officers and your city employees, um, possibly as well. Um, also, something else to note was um, as an essential facility, you want to be operational when everything else shuts down in the building, so you want a backup generator that is fully operational. Um, the backup generator at the police was found to be pretty old, will not be able to fully probably back up the uh, police station in an event of emergency or last a, a, a long duration. Um, it also can be tampered with right now, it's currently not really in the secure zone as well, so just something else to note there. Um, the community center at EOC, so this building itself, um, we found that, you know, for this, we have a very large space here. Um, it's adequately sized for the community that you're currently in now and the future. Um, we're just probably looking more at just some of the dated finishes. We know there are some uh, asbestos present in this building that will need to be evaded and uh, mitigated um, at if any remodels were to occur. Um, and again, there's um, just kitchen equipment, plumbing, uh, mechanical systems that are not fully functioning well and it's at their in, um, end of its useful life. Um, when we call EOC or Emergency Operations Center, you know, in an event of an emergency, it's the same category as a police station. We expect the building to withstand a seismic event or a natural disaster and remain operational. At this time, the uh, structure itself will need to be hardened, um, like Cyrus mentioned, in the police facility um, and in order to meet that criteria and that way you can um, operate as an emergency operations center. Um, I know previously at the community outreach meeting we had a question about what is an emergency operations center. Um, this is basically where your city council members, your um, public officials running the city, uh, fire department, police department, they use it as a command center basically to run the city, call FEMA, get backup support from federal, um, get some money or whether it's support. It's really the heart of when things go wrong, unfortunately, and so that you can service and um, approach all your community members and your citizens so to protect them. So, um, so that's that. And then library. So your, your lovely library, one of the newer facilities that we uh, got to evaluate. Um, it's, it's fantastic, uh, if, if you didn't already know that. Um, so future growth uh, definitely has quite adequate space uh, for current needs as well as uh, future projected needs. Uh, there are in the spaces and kind of deeper where the public doesn't necessarily see on a daily basis, there are some minor flow and space issues as, 
as you know, I, the design was met the needs at the time it was constructed, and then as you move in and as staff and things figure out how they really need to operate in the space, that there's just some minor things that have could, could use a little little rework, little little remodel possibly. Um, but as far as code and life safety solid building uh, in, in great condition. Uh, the structure as well is in good good condition. Um, everything seemed quite up to par and uh, it's, it's a good space. Um, as well as the MEP system. Still currently in a good uh, functioning uh, functioning system well within its serviceable life. It's not necessarily the most efficient system uh, to use in that building, um, but it is uh, operating as intended. So frontline is the memorial pool. Um, so while the pool itself is adequately sized, unfortunately the supporting spaces, such as the locker rooms and some of the um, lobby areas are definitely not adequate to support uh, any more people coming into that area. Um, so there's definitely need for room for growth. Um, as far as building and life safety, there are a few concerns about safety. Um, there's um, some slip resistant floor issues in the locker rooms. It's just not an, a good enough grip um, where it will keep people from slipping and falling. Um, it's non-ADA compliant. Um, there are certain approach issues. Um, I believe there are some improvements that have been made, but there could be more um, to accommodate. Um, there are some data finishes, of course, uh, drainage issue. Uh, there seems to be some flooding issues in the pool um, locker rooms area where it's just not draining properly. Um, as well as it's also requiring a new roof. Um, we've also noticed the structural system, because of the humidity of the um, pool itself, the moisture that it causes, has actually started to damage the wood beams um, in the main area. So there's, um, there's that issue, as well as cracking in the CMU walls that will need to be repaired um, to structurally kind of harden that building as well. Um, as far as MEP, there are some uh, um, energy code issues. Um, it does not. It would not meet the current energy code usage. All building systems are kind of at its end useful life. Um, there, are, another thing with kind of code compliance is there's kind of chemicals that are being stored with some things that shouldn't be stored together and different things like that. So those are things that are uh, we looked at and took account um, as well. So last one. All right. Neighborhood uh, Planning and Public Works Office, across the street in actually a leased building uh, across the street from City Hall. Uh, so it not being a city-owned property, we did not evaluate uh, the uh, as far as the structural system or the MEP systems, just because there's not necessarily uh, the, that level of importance for reviewing uh, those on their life cycle basis, uh, since it's a leased facility. But as far as future growth, um, they right now are already at a maximum capacity. Uh, they, they lack space for their proper storage and use of their flat files, their, their large scale drawings uh, that they're reviewing and producing on a daily basis. Um, and there's not a lot of option for reworking the space um, and again as a leased facility um, to make that uh, even a little bit better uh, in, the, in the shorter interim. Building and life safety, uh, so there are uh, plenty of non-ADA compliant areas as far as the restrooms, the break rooms, and just generally through the circulation through the space. Um, there's dated finishes um, and a lack of separation uh, or even a any sort of security or delineation between publicly accessible spaces and actual staff spaces. So to get to some offices you're walking through what would possibly be defined as a public lobby or as a as a uh, exchange area between the public and staff um, and the public would have access throughout the the remainder of the space uh, with that. Um, but yeah. So 
So we took all of these things into account and started to put pri a priority list. So when you're looking at a master plan and order of importance or order of needs, um, we started prioritizing with the essential facilities first um, uh, so that you can respond to your citizens first. So high on the list and uh, number one would be the police or EOC. Um, these are operationally, op operationally important for your city to function. Um, these are also the buildings that were requiring probably the most um, improvements as well. Um, not only as a space needs but also a structural need and mechanical electrical and plumbing needs. Um, next came along the city hall um, as well just because of their need for space um, and also getting public works and planning following that their own space getting out of a, maybe a lease space and finding a more uh, central location where they're so cl close to city hall um, maybe closer than just like right across the street <laughs> um, as well um, the pool although the building itself is probably by far you know has the most damage to it it's not exactly an essential um, operations or facility needs for the city it's kind of a amenity, amenity sorry um, and so um, that's why it's lower on the um, on the list as well as the community center we understand this is still kind of a underutilized space um, so um, just lowering that in the priority as well as the library of course is by far the newest um, building of all your facilities that we have evaluated and therefore at the bottom of it so that's kind of where we have ranked currently um, your facility needs and how we sh we feel that you guys should look to replacing and renovating or looking at a combination facility um, so the next steps for us is uh, looking at a conceptual master planning. So now we've identified the deficiencies of all of these facilities. Now we take that information, we prioritize them. Now we're looking at, okay, are we going to be renovating each of these facilities? Or is it better to consider a new site? for a brand new building. And this brand new building could be a combination of police, city hall, public works and planning, and maybe an EOC room or a community room. Those can be all combined. Um, so um, the task force has identified two sites that they would like to um, look at. These are already city owned properties, um, so it would not um, add to the uh, cost. But we're looking at the state and dog park site. Um, there are three different, different tax plots that can be combined um, to look at a combined facility of police, city hall, public works and planning. And then um, also the community center site or this site itself. How, there's plenty of land on this area so how can we rearrange this site to possibly be a big campus of city facilities um, is something that we will also be taking a look at at this point. Um, so while we're developing this conceptual site plans and uh, uh, master plan, our next public outreach meeting and uh, we would like to get um, public feedback on what we come up with as different uh, renovations or new facility site diagrams um, will be on March 25th. And right after that public outreach meeting, we will present to City Council um, some of the comments that we received from the public outreach meeting as well as um, some of the design decisions that we have made. So okay. um, with that, um, we'll be happy to take some questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's start with, um, thank you, Kathy and, and, um, and Jeff and, and Cyrus. Um, let's start with some the way the agenda is set up, public comments. So Aaron, you wanted to speak on this one. We'll get a bunch of council questions here in a little bit. Go ahead, please. Aaron Frichtel, 12326 Golf Lane, Southeast Sublimity, Oregon. I uh, have two buildings that are directly right by each of those buildings. One is directly behind this building here, uh, family owned, and also uh, my building that I'm working on right beside the police station. So uh, very interested in seeing future planning and I think that uh, after talking with the police chief I recognize some serious needs for secure parking, for facilities that support uh, a secure environment for our police force. I think that that's very valid. Um, I'm, a, I'm a concerned citizen in the sense that I don't want to see 
uh, our downtown core being vacated and and uh, having a vacuum, uh, so to speak. And so, as part of uh, RDS and the Economic Vitality Committee, I'm also uh, looking at uh, ways that we can bring new business in. But one thing that I thought would be uh, a valid thing to think about as an idea is if the police went into a new facility into a secure they had a secure lot and had great facilities and then city hall could expand into the space vacated by the police uh, department and i think that that might be a really valid option uh, without leaving the downtown core kind of vacant f by all the city staff and i know that uh, fourth uh, going down just a little bit further isn't that far away necessarily but uh, one thing, if the police station would move to a new facility, it would also allow some public parking in the area that's currently being taken by police vehicles. And I can remember growing up as a little boy and having the entire side of my building available for parking. And, uh, and I know that as the police force grows, you just don't have that that luxury of being able to, to leave those spots open for public use. But that would give us a, a small parking lot in our downtown core that I think would be very valuable and uh, something that would be used by the community. And we would still have City Hall there where it's accessible by people and, uh, and uh, admittedly, city staff are good customers as well. So it's good to not move them away from the core. And I think that that would be a very valuable thing to think about. But I support growth and I think that uh, I definitely highly support the idea of the police station having a better facility. And um, I just think that that sort of an idea set might help with, uh, with some of the concerns. And it would allow City Hall to, to expand and to be able to retrofit and do some seismic upgrades and, and facility, um, facility upgrades that they don't currently have. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Okay. Other, uh, other public comments on this presentation? And if not, we'll go to council questions. Sure. So who wants to start? Chris? Yeah, just a quick question. So it seems to me from a safety and security perspective that having all of your, um, all of those essential functions co-located could be an issue, like all your eggs in one basket kind of a thing. Do you guys have any, have you received feedback on work that you've done in the past or recommendations that you would make on what of those essential functions you would co-locate? Because it seems like the city hall, you'd want to have that separate from the police. You'd want to have the emergency operations center separate just in case. So um, we can ask this in a couple of different ways. Um, we do have history, as you kind of saw in our first slides, um, Kaiser City Hall and police, um, Lake Oswego City Hall and police. We are seeing more and more um, city amenities coming together. Um, there's actually, um, we've found that consolidating M into one building, um, putting all your eggs in one basket, um, as you said, is actually a good use of space. Um, you can actually start um, combining um, um, uh, rooms and spaces together so you're decreasing the size uh, overall. For example, your emergency operations center, you're only going to use as an emergency facility, but if you can use that also as a community center, a city council chambers, or a municipal court, um, you're saving that much on operations and maintenance, less maintenance on facilities, as well as also on, um, uh, sorry, lost my mind <laughs> for a minute, um, as well as um, overall space as well, usability, less square footage, um, and costs to the building. Um, we're also finding that in an event of emergency, you're actually bringing all of all those, all of these people together um, so having them at the same location has not been an issue as far as I know and Jeff Humphreys can ac actually talk more about that as well as he's done some combined facilities but we are seeing the trend is to actually start combining them or have them in closer proximities and we're also strategically locating them on the city so that they're away from you know rivers or they're away from flood zones and different things like that so that they're not they're away from those major disaster areas or okay. critical zones. I hope I answered that question for yes, you. Yes, you did. Thank yes. you. Okay. One quick follow-up. Sure. Go ahead. So since the library's in good shape, how about we take all the books 
Move him to the police station. Move the police to the <laughs> library. Yeah, Dave? Chief? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I could comment on that. Um, so libraries and um, police stations are built to a different risk category. Uh, so unfortunately, even if the police moved into the library, we would still have to renovate the facility to a, a higher risk category to withstand a seismic um, event. So we would still have to do some structural hardening. So unfortunately, you wouldn't get away with no renovation. <laughs> I love my library. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it shows, um, yeah. Kathy, um, whoever wants to take this one, is there any way to get an idea of, of how much or how little, how much of a seismic event any of these buildings would would handle? These wooden buildings. I'm I'm concerned about this one and and the library and the pool. Um, I don't know. Will they will they take any kind of seismic event? Um, according to our structural engineer, we did everything we could to poke up every ceiling tile and right. wherever access we can get. Um, we believe that you guys will be able to get out for some of these buildings, but because of the way these were built, um, we can't say for sure how much it's going to withstand, but um, and that you might be able to get out. But certain areas might collapse more than others. So life safety, right? Life safety wise, um, yeah, that use. yes, mm -hmm. continued use. Yeah. Has anyone else in here been in a real shaker? Yes. Here. That's a real experience, isn't it? Yes. Just at OMSI. You are absolutely <laughs> helpless. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, your your hey. instinct tells you to run, oh, and that's the worst thing you can do. You can't do. move. Yeah. It's it's a horrific experience. People say, "Oh, we might have an earthquake." Oh, <laughs> no, thank. <laughs> Not around here. Somebody else, please Mr. go ahead. Mayor. Lots of neat questions here possible for these folks. Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. This is really great. Um, I think that. Having this out to the public will really, the way that it's presented, it, it makes it really clear for us to understand we need new buildings. Uh, I'm a fan of them all going coming together. I'm wondering in your past projects, um, how did those cities go about like getting community support funding, things like that? Do they do levies or like is it normal to take it to the voters? Like. That's the kind of stuff that I want to know. Well, that's actually part of the study that we'll be completing. So once we ident identify the needs and next steps and which path you want to go, we'll help you guys identify some of the grants that are available to the city um, and um, identify what your financial status is so that you can look at, okay, do we need to go out for a bond? Or is there a grant that you can apply for? Um, there's also a USDA loan. Those are just some examples that we have um, personally worked with with different um, jurisdictions so that they can get funded for their new public safety facility or what civic building that they need. So um, it is forthcoming um, and we do have some experience in um, identifying getting you guys the funds you need. When you go out for a bond, uh, we definitely can help you guys with the bond campaigning efforts. We always Always recommend transparency with your community help them get involved um, and so we help you guys plan these public outreach meetings so uh, strategically um, and often so that they can feel like they're part of the community we want them to feel like this is their building they're paying for these buildings and so we want them to have a voice and so uh, we encourage that you guys continue to have these public outreach meetings continue to share at City Council meetings of what the goals are Good, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I understand you guys did on Wednesday an event, correct, for some public outreach. Did you have a lot of community members come and attend and give you guys anything okay. useful? We had approximately a dozen people, I believe, okay. um, and we had some very good questions. Um, there's, a, a, of course, there's a lot of jargon here of like, what's yeah. an EOC? How does the city function? And so we've answered a lot of, I believe, questions that um, in regards to how the city functions. Um, there wasn't any actual comments um, per se about 
oh, I, I prefer this over that or anything right. like that, but it was a, a good awareness um, and letting the community aware of what, what's happening and why we're doing the study and the results of the study. So kind of starting the conversation. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's good. Kathy, uh, one of the comments that um, has come up in the presentation is um, we have, with regard to police stations, we have to build them to uh, more secure standards. In this happy place, people don't attack police stations. Hmm. That only happens in other places. So why not have lots of windows and open access? No, I, I know the answer, but I mean, it's, uh, it's, it can see, to someone who hasn't thought about it at all, why would a police station have to be any different than any other public facility? But they do. Okay, that answered my own <laughs> thought there. Which is a good thing once in a while. Somebody else, come on. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, I have a question about like, when your guys' past projects, what's like the, what have you guys noticed in the cost difference of like having to do individual buildings versus combining them all together? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, you wanna get the most bang for your buck and, and I know as a taxpayer myself, I'm not going to want to pay for a whole bunch of buildings if it's way cheaper to put them all together and it's still safe and it makes sense. Um, maybe Jeff can help me sure. um, answer this one. Um, I know we've done, um, there's pros and cons to both to right. consider. Like there's phasing that you can consider. I would love to hear all the pros yeah. and cons that okay. you can think of. So we'll let Jeff start first. <laughs> okay. uh, so there's, there's not a right answer to this, okay. but um, there are a lot of efficiencies associated having uh, fewer buildings, whether that's one or two versus five different buildings for these pro um, program elements. Um, so when we're designing the projects to meet essential facility requirements, they obviously have a higher premium because they're being built to a higher standard than a regular commercial structure. So that's something that could lead toward a, no, no, let's only do the police and EOC as a essential facility, that'll be a standalone project. Um, when we did the Kaiser City Hall project, that's one building, there's a seismic joint that separates out the police side from the city hall side. That was a cost strategy, right? So the police can remain operational, the EOC component can remain operational, city function, people get out of the building, once the event's over with, they can come back in and figure out what needs to be done um, to the structure. Um, the advantages of, of combining them also would be um, the space reduction. So, you know, you might have about a 15, 10 to 15% premium of what the structural uh, requirements are for a essential facility over a commercial structure. Um, that actually will come through for MEP systems because they have to be restrained to a higher level, those sorts of things. Um, uh, when you get to the point where you, well, you know what, let's go ahead and combine the facilities together. We're going to reduce our square footages. Um, if we reduce the square footage, it doesn't matter what the cost per square foot is, you're still going to be benefiting a reduction in overall size of the facility. Um, so that will reduce the cost of it. Um, your mechanical systems might be a combined uh, mechanical system. So if they're not, you know, they're operating 24 seven for the police side, and they don't need to operate for the city hall side, but it's one system. It's just that they're just not pumping in air, cool air, warm air to the city hall side. So your mechanical systems could potentially go down for a combined facility versus having separate buildings. Um, trying to think of other elements. Uh, okay. We've done it both ways. Uh, I think there is a growing trend to actually have them combine for some of these reasons that I just mentioned. Um, but a large portion of our projects, they have been separate facilities. Um, just because overall, the overall size and scale of the project is going to generate a cost. And so sometimes it's, it's difficult to come up with the funding on that. And so it's, a, it's more of a, well, let's bite off what we can handle now and we'll deal with this other piece at a later time. Does that help a little bit? Very much so. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. I've got one more. Um, back to um, uh, seismic things. That beautiful picture of that Kaiser City Hall and police in your presentation there, that's built with those some kind of heavy cement block, right? Uh, whatever it's called, I, I don't know, but that is yeah, it's a the standard, Kathy, the standard on that is that'll take anything that nature can throw at it 
Um, there are several reinforcements um, for the Emergency Operations Center. I believe that one had some steel structure on inside of the masonry walls or um, just on okay. the interior side. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of reinforcements besides just the masonry on the exterior. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes the um, exterior can function as a structural element, sometimes it's not. Um, so there's different ways that we can approach a structural system. Um, to but make those it such a buildings like that are literally built to take anything nature can throw at them, right? We do the best we can, yes. <laughs> Fire, tornadoes, seismic events? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. All right, thank you. I guess I knew the answer to that too, but I just wanted to hear you folks reinforce it. Yeah, okay. Somebody else? Okay. Is that it? Very informative. It was great. Do a great job. Yeah. It's Thank almost you for having Thank you. <laughs> it is what it is. Okay. And thank you for being here this evening. Mr. Mayor. Uh, let's go on. Um, let's see, we're done with the choo choo. Resolution number 1001 to apply for a local government grant from the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department for the development of Mill Creek Park. Mr. Lutwick. Thank you, Mr. Lance. Mayor. This is uh, really a resolution that I brought to you uh, to the council last year. Uh, okay. I believe it was nine something. Um, but this year, since we're going for, uh, we're gonna be applying for another OPRD grant. Um, we have to come up with a 40% match. And so I wanted the council to be clear on that 40% match uh, prior to agreeing to this resolution and allowing for the city manager to apply for that. Um, background information, um, for those of you who are not aware, the city purchased 23 acres along Mill Creek in approximately 2017, uh, early 2017. Uh, in 2018, the city hired AKS Engineering to provide a uh, uh, park master plan for that. We had community involvement for well over a year. We had two different meetings for the community to come and decide what kind of elements they want in this park. Uh, we concluded that in December, um, and uh, city staff was going to put together a grant application last spring. And that is why I brought to you the resolution prior to this. Um, but we didn't get to it. We didn't have enough time to make the April 1st deadline. This year we actually uh, consulted with an actual grant writer. We're well on our way. We'll probably have the grant application complete um, by the 1st of March. Um, but in order to go forward, I'd like the city council to realize that there is that 40% match and that equates to about $500,000. But with this grant application, it allows us to use the purchase price of the Kendall Way property, which is about $260,000. So if the OPRD was to grant us a $750,000 grant, the city would have to come up with $240,000. Um, I have an idea where some of those funds would come from. They'd come from the various funds because those are infrastructure improvements for a lot of the park. But we'd still have to come up with some funds. Uh, I wanted the city council to be aware of that prior to voting on this resolution, which is why I brought this back before you. So with that, uh, you know uh, what this grant, uh, this resolution is about. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer what you have. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, public comments on this, this resolution. Anything? Is there a way to get more information about it? Got a question, Aaron. Get up there and share it with us, please. I'm interested in receiving more information about it. I live uh, through the woods on the other side, so. <laughs> You're happy to come down to the Public Works Office. Fantastic. Um, and I can show you the master plan. It's been in the works for two years. Great. And I can give you all the public input that we've gotten received. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Anything else there? Uh, council discussion? 
Council of Liberation. Mr. Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think that we, I just wanted to say that we, I think we also have some of those plans online too from previous council meetings if you didn't want to have to drive, all, like, it's not that far, but still. If you <laughs> want to do it from the comfort of your own home, there's very <laughs> nice maps that show it. It's, it's a pretty cool park. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. I do have a question though, follow up. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're wrong. Is it, Lance, is it normal? Is it like a normal thing for a council to approve a $240,000 payment for something like? Well, I, I don't. I, just, I, I think for it a is. park. I know, but for for a park like that. Well, I don't know if it's normal or not. That's I guess it's why it's before you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> if it was just you know, I think it's your guys' decision to make. It's not my decision to make. I. Uh, you know, we can go out for this grant money, or we we can wait. It, it's really up to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. At some point in time, if you want to do something with this park and build amenities, though, um, with the park funds that we generate annually, you won't be doing anything with it. It'll be open space, which might be what you want to do with it. But if you want to put playground equipment in it, if you want to build a baseball park. If you want to put any kind of facilities or elements in there, you'll have to go out and you'll have to get to generate funds somehow. Yeah. And uh, the OPRD mm -hmm. is very generous with their funds. Um, Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars is pretty tough to say no. Um, I, I realize you have to come up with you know five hundred thousand, but again, in this circumstance, I will. I do want to point out this: in this circumstance, we're able to use a portion of the money that we paid for that property as our match. We can only do that for three years. After that, we can no longer use that. So then it'll be just, you gotta come up with $500,000 and it, it's gotta be come up with in-kind donations, uh, that type of thing, which is a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Thank you, that's really good information. I have a question. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Um, the 40% is that calculated off a different number because it's some not a math major, but 40% of 70, 750 is. You have to basically divide 750,000 by 0.6, comes up to be 500,000 bucks. Okay. So, Mr. Mayor, unless you're still no, on. Okay. Uh, I guess the question would be for Keith or Susanna here is this feasible for us in our future to be able to pay that amount down the road since a portion of this will be recognized that we spent to put up to buy the property itself is that quarter million dollar price price tag something that's feasible for us yeah the, the, the price tag is feasible I mean and to answer the a previous question we're bringing it forward because what you would see is is this would be a budgeted item for right. the next budget cycle um, we would need to put it into the next budget and you know what we essentially need is, is buy-in at this point to say yeah. Uh, we can do it. We've looked at the the, the numbers and, the, and that, and, and feel comfortable that we can come up with the money. Um, it's kind of hard to say no to a match of seven hundred fifty thousand too. So, I mean, I think it's it's you know investment dollars. It's it's worth doing. But yeah, we've had the conversations and believe so. But we do we did bring this forward because it's beyond the spending authority that we have vested in us, and we wanted to make sure that you guys were on board when this came to the budget committee for for consideration. And that's great. Thank you so much. So okay. one, one thing I would like, the one last thing, and I'll let you guys deliberate, is that the master plan elements the community picked out, the total costs for that are in excess of four and a half million dollars. So if we are to build, this is going to have to be done in phases, right? Over a long period of time. Um, but in order for us to start that, our parks department, I think we're, we're I don't know, a couple hundred thousand a year <laughs> to run all the parks and maintain and maintenance and all that. So there, there's not much there to build a park with. Okay. All right. Good. Mr. Mayor. Other questions? Yes. Go ahead. Um, is, is there a way that over the years we could um, do like a city campaign to the community and see if they, you know, like outreach and see if they'd support um, some type of, you know, a, a le I don't, a levy or a bond, I think is a bond, is what they do for parks, right? There are a variety of things that you can do, mechanisms yeah. to finance it. But is that something that the Parks Department would be interested in, like, um, at some point doing out outreach and, and seeing what the 
the scope it or what the, the temperature is on the community of, of their support for that so that um, we can get. I'm not a finance major, but what I would say is you have to have some sort of leverage to pay those bonds back. And I don't think we have a dedicated funding source for parks other than general fund. Am I incorrect there? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's generally how you pay your bonds back is a dedicated funding source for like streets. If we wanted to go borrow $3 million to yeah. reduce streets, we've got a street fee to help pay that back. And it's a, genera it's a source that directly goes to street fees. We don't have anything like that for parks. It just comes right out of the general fund. Um, so we'd have to do some things, move some things around, maybe right. generate a parks fee type thing, and perhaps then, and I'll let Keith and Susanna speak to it more, but that's my understanding of if we wanted to do that, that's what we'd probably need to do. Dedicated funding, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Other questions or thoughts? Mr. Mayor, I have one no. more question no. for Lance. Go ahead. When you say phases, um, will the park still be um, pretty well usable even if it doesn't have all the amenities yet and we did it in phases like would it just be blocked off with i don't know uh construction stuff or because i mean i think the the homeowners on kindle are going to want to know what that's going to look like for three or four years well to be honest right now there's a sign out there that says it's mill creek open space so you can go out and use it perfect so um, it's not going to close down we we want it there for people to use even if it's just walking along mill creek there are no paths, um, but it's open now. So our, our, my uh, thought is phase one, we've looked at this. Phase one will include uh, two or three um, picnic shelters, uh, an actual child's playground, um, parking, um, a nature path going all the way around the park, um, and grading. I mean, grading, there's a lot of just inf uh, construction work that needs to be done to just to get that to work uh, and so there's a, there's fun there's money that goes into that and it's not money that you're going to see by just looking at the elements it's the preparation to get to the elements so thank you so much okay folks done with questions you ready to go to some de with deliberating and how about a council decision on this hmm? Should you yeah we did public yeah. comment okay. I'm getting better great reading the agenda Mr. Mayor? Yes. Unless we would like to deliberate some more, I would like to move well, go ahead. to approve resolution number 1001 as presented. I'll second. Okay, a motion and a second to approve resolution 1001, which does authorizing the city manager to apply for and sign an Oregon Parks and Recreation Development Grant. Department grant application. Okay. Were there were there other questions? Go ahead. No. Okay. Anyone else? I, did, I have questions or deliberation? Are we deliberating? Go ahead. Yeah. That's okay. fine. Mr. Mayor. Um, I just... A motion and a second, but go ahead. We're fine. Yeah, but don't we discuss? Discuss it? Discuss the motion? Sure. I mean, that's no. normally what we do. Go ahead. Ms. Robert's Ms. rules. Council? Okay. Um, anyway, I I think that this is a really uh, good thing for our city because we don't have enough things for our teens and kids to do anyway. It will keep them busy. I'm just trying to think of reasons like how how do we justify spending two hundred forty thousand um, dollars? But I think that it's like here in black and white where you see that we're going to be getting what seven hundred fifty thousand dollars plus. Uh, we can leverage the money that we paid for the property so that's I mean really we're getting this huge park for not that much I mean when you look at the grand scheme of it and the types of things that people can do there with the picnic shelters and the walking trails I think it's I think it's so good I'm I'm in, I'm in support of it it's my my thoughts yeah thank you this is um on the heels of our earlier presentation about um, buildings ending their, at the end of their useful life and what to do with that, and also the need to preserve and maintain as many of these public facilities as we can. Um, yeah, let's move ahead with this, but uh, just 
burden on burden of uh, how do we how do we do all this? How do we pay for it? How do we maintain it? Um, big questions. Uh, I guess we'll try to be part of the solution. That's a profound thought, isn't it? Yeah. Alyssa, would you poll the council on this, please? Councilor McDonald? Aye. Councilor yes. Hook? Yes. Councilor Mullen? Yes. Councilor Patty? Yes. Motion passed four to zero. Okay, thank you. All right. Moving right along. Communications from mayor and councilors. I don't have anything else this evening. Uh, looking forward to going down to Mocks and Berry. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Saturday that'd be, afternoon. That'll be Moxie Berry from Moxie 1 to 3 and on Saturday afternoon on the 27th. I was ready to go over to Ixtapa. He really wanted those margaritas. Yeah, me too. Thinking, but unfortunately, I couldn't get in touch with them. The water hole might have been open. and I can I can tell you that uh, when I do chat with the counselor, there will be margaritas <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> All right, anyway. You can bring your own. That's right. <laughs> Anyway, uh, no, there's a there's a business meeting, folks. Now, come on. I'm not <laughs> just worried about Margaritaville. Um, but uh, that's that's going on. Um, what from one to three? One to three. Okay. No, I mean, it's specifically not a business meeting. What is it? Kind of the point, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What, are, what else? What else? Folks? I, I don't no know deliberation. Else no decisions will be Mr. taking Mayor. place. Um, so I, I just had a, a, a meeting with uh, with Kurt Schrader, our, our congressman. It was a community leaders uh, roundtable, and he said that because um, I brought up, you know, that we were going to need um, some some extra services, secondary water source, and. Uh, uh, let's see what else did I talk about um, sorry um, secondary water source and uh, like services for you know homeless and things like that and he had said for the the secondary water source that they are going to be putting uh, through in DC they're hoping um, uh, a bill that will may help us out with with that um, so I'm, I'm hopeful for that I also pitched our problem with uh, you know, Norpak closing down, um, so that he was aware of that, and that you know we could use some help, um, just with in general with maybe giving some attention to it, so that maybe we can get some funding to get that big building back up and running, or a new one in there, or something. Um, but it was a, it was a good meeting, and then uh, also. I wanted to say that um, I'm super glad that uh, Kevin Mannix had come down to talk about the training because the information that he provided was way better uh, than I expected even based off of the last one because I, I just want you guys to know I, I, I do address uh, Russ that you said it took a month you know a month to do this but I you know I was elected to ask questions because that I knocked doors and that's what people wanted they wanted to make sure that we explored these things and didn't just make decisions without any thought um, I w it wasn't enough for me the last time there weren't any any answers um, and unfortunately what happens is uh, we have to wait two weeks until another one and then when they send a representative that doesn't answer those questions any any questions then we have to wait two more so it's unfortunate that he had to come out here that it had to take a, a month but I feel like we got great answers I think that this railroad thing will be great for for the community overall um, I know down in Coos Bay uh, it's like their lifeblood that that railroad so Hopefully it really helps us when it gets in here. I like that it would be only like three years. I really liked getting that answer because um, then we know it's not going to be you know 20 years down the line. Um, so yeah, and then I just wanted to remind everybody that the census is coming up and uh, Marion County Commissioners uh, meeting that we had here in Staten, they were talking about that 23% of our town do, does not have access to a computer in, in their home. And that that equates to about six million dollars worth of services that we would not be getting. So talk to everyone you can about the census. See what their plans are for taking. If they have, uh, if they have a computer, let them know that the library has computers. Um, just really start talking about this because it, six million dollars is a lot of money for our community. Uh, and if we don't count 
the residents that live here, we're not going to get the money. So it's a half decent job too. It's like seventeen bucks an hour to be a census taker. So yeah, you can sign up and be a census taker. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, other things from council. Yes. Go ahead. Real quick, uh, Councilor Hook, you mentioned a bill in D.C. that may establish a secondary water source for our town. Well, Could you mention the our, name of it? Sorry. Um, let me look at my notes here. Okay. Thank you. Or maybe just over email. I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I can send. I can send it to you, you, and then I can try and follow up the next meeting to get the exact name of it because he didn't give an exact name. But um, it's a water resources bill, is what he called it, and it may have grant money. Oh, it may have grant uh, grant money for secondary water sources, is what I understand, and and the infrastructure problem that we have underneath our streets down there. That's that's the really exciting part. Thank you for asking that question, because um, the streets that are downtown in in your neighborhood, uh, he said that this bill might address some of those sewer system things um, and and getting us a little bit more help, rural communities help. So, because I I explained it. In detail like what was wrong that there's nothing underneath there um, and so he said wait and see uh, how this bill turns out this water resources bill um, they're doing bipartisan work on out on uh, the problems that we had with the algae blooms um, also uh, an ag workforce uh, bill that they're working on so it was a lot of like good stuff that he, he really focused on how it would help our our area, which is is nice to know that we're being thought of yeah. out here yep. over in DC. <laughs> is it is it being mean to just wish there were fewer fuel spills into the river? Right. As we go along, straighten out 22, especially the area between Idana and Marion Forks. Mm -hmm. Straighten that 12 or 15 miles out and. There's most of the problem. Anyway. So, um, Mr. Mayor, now that you mentioned the fuel spill, um, I got an update this afternoon by the EPA, uh, 3.30 this afternoon. And the bad news is, is yes, we had another fuel spill. Another uh, tanker truck with a truck and trailer. They lost about, they think about 10,000 gallons of fuel, a combination of diesel and gas. Um, most of it got into the bank. They're excavating the bank down to bedrock. Um, they've taken water samples two, four, six, and eight miles downstream. As of today, the f that four miles now, uh, four miles downstream from the site where it spilled, they got their first samples back, and the the fuel detect in that is below. It's either non-detect or it's below what's safe for water, drinking water. Okay. So I just want you to be aware of that. There, we should be getting, tomorrow we'll be meeting again and uh, we'll be talking about the six and the eight miles down and see if we've got any detectable. Uh, they also have walked the uh, river. Uh, they found one dead three inch salmon right at the site. Other than that, they haven't found any kind of dead fish or any kind of thing like that. So, all things being considered, it's looking pretty good, even though we had a fuel spill and they've shut that down. They're having to shut that road down. They're having to redo the whole road. They had to dig all the way across it. So it's gonna be shut down for a little while. Wow. That's all I know. All right, mm -hmm. thank you, Lance. Yes, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. Other thoughts from counselors before we go to the staff? And Go ahead. Yeah, uh, to address the name of the bill for you. I was just looking that up uh, for you. Uh, it's I believe it's HR 3510, HR.3510. It's Water Resources Re Research Amendments Act. Um, so hopefully that was Thank you. helpful. I appreciate that. House Joint Resolution. Is it HJR? It says HR. HR, it's House Resolution. Resolution, okay. But I, I haven't read the text, so I'm hoping that that's what, that's okay. what that one is. All right, good. Keith, I think you're on. Um, well, I, I, Lance sort of took what I, I was wanting to talk about and, and had, had 
indicated, but I wanted to do something else here, which is I wanted to give my appreciation to Michael Bradley and to Lance this weekend. It seems like these always happen on the weekend, and um, you know they they were on it and handled it and, and made sure that uh, we were taking the proper steps and precautions to make sure that our water was was safe to our community. So I appreciate the work they did. I appreciate the work they did um, above and beyond, and, and wanted to publicly thank them for that and uh, the recognition and the continued work they're doing. I know there's been some stuff on social media and, and in Salem, and people seem to to be concerned. But I, I want people to know that our staff is working on this and addressing this and and is handling this so um, if there's a change we'll we'll notify the public but there has been no risk um, to the public with the water um, I appreciate the work they've done behind the scenes I'm aware of, of some of the things and the planning and that went into uh, being responsive as soon as they were aware of the issue so I will continue to work with state agencies about uh, communication um, so that we can make sure that we have uh, checks and balances but uh, just wanted to publicly thank them okay. thank you thank you so much is there anything else this evening? Uh, we have a couple of future items, a Marion County presentation on tobacco and substance abuse, and a public hearing on a Fern Ridge annexation and comprehensive plan amendment. And that will take care of the March, first March meeting, I bet. So if there's nothing else, thank you for all being here this evening. Have a good evening, a safe home. Good night. Yeah,